Hi, welcome to my channel, Common Sense Ethics. My name is Leah, and today I want to discuss with you a really important concept in um, politics. Um, actually, this, this one idea is really important because it sort of explains a lot of the problems with government and with political parties and with um, formal organizations. Um, so what, what, is that, um, what is that concept? I want to talk to you about the Iron Law of Oligarchy. Um, I first heard about this concept in high school. I had a really good teacher my junior and senior year, um, and he had mentioned it, and it always stuck with me um, as, you know, sort of a really good explanation um, for the way a lot of things work. But um, then later, you know, I wanted to re revisit that concept, um, so I did sort of a deep dive into it, and I had an article published about four and a half years ago on um, an online magazine, and I actually just republished that article on my website, which is Common Sense Ethics. Um, so if you're the type who would rather read um, or also read about, um, you know, the same thing I'm going to be talking about today, I'll link to that article in the description. So what is um, the Iron Law of Oligarchy? Um, the Iron Law of Oligarchy was, the, uh, that idea was originated by Robert Michaels, who was a German historian um, in the early 20th century. And he wrote um, a book published in 1915 called Political Parties, a Sociological Study of the Oligarchical Tendencies of Modern Democracy. Um, this book, it's really important because even though it's published over 100 years ago, it basically begs us to examine the maxim that power tends to corrupt. Um, and it also exposes a lot of the flaws within democracy and within formal organizations and government themselves. So what is oligarchy? Oligarchy is defined um, by, at, ruled by an elite or a privileged few. Um, so people will use that term to refer to sort of a leadership class of cl corporate pl plutocrats or something of that nature. Um, but what is less understood is how oligarchies, oligarchies form um, to begin with. So Robert Michaels, um, he came up with this idea of the iron law of oligarchy, that basically oligarchy is a sociological law. Um, and it's all, it's an ex explanation for how oligarchies form, but it's also a compelling critique of sort of the flawed structure of, um, organizations in and of themselves, right? Including government and political parties. So Michaels drew on his own experience as, um, a social Democrat in the early 20th century, um, when he wrote this book. Um, he grew up in, um, Germany, which at the time was Prussia, and he planned to, um, have a career in the Prussian army. Um, but around 1903, he read Rousseau and he had a sudden change of heart and he quit the army and he sort of rejected, at least for a time, his bourgeois upbringing. And he got deeply involved in the party politics of the Social Democratic Party in Germany at that time. Um, but after about four years in 1907, he became really disillusioned with the Social Democratic Party. And the reason for that was that even though um, socialist, you know, party, um, Democratic Party claimed to be egalitarian, the way that it functioned internally and behind the scenes, he felt to be really profoundly undemocratic, right? Um, and so he was really disillusioned with this, and um, he uh, later wrote um, the book Political Parties, which explains the iron law of oligarchy, right? Um, so the major premises of his argument are that leaders are indispensable in democracy and in all organizations and in social life itself. But the inevitable tendency of all leaders is to, well, all or most, almost all, um, is to assert autocratic control, right? So a corollary of these premises that he sets forth is that um, organization is based upon the principle of least effort. That is to say that the greatest possible economy of energy, and that um, is the weapon of the strong, right? Organization means oligarchy, um, whether of popularly chosen leaders or dominant um, minority and so on. So what does that mean? Um, okay. So the iron law of oligarchy works in the following way. Even in formal organizations where power is theoretically distributed among the membership or the people at large, there's always going to be a small class of decision makers, right, or leaders. And this is utilitarian, like he said. Um, 
but and it's pragmatic because um, it's impossible for everybody to have a direct say in the leadership of a large organization or of government. I mean, that's just nothing could get done. No consensus could ever be reached. Right. So leaders have to, for that reason, take on more power than the members or the electorate who put them there in the first place. Um, but the problem is that once in power, leaders tend to want to stay in power and they begin to ignore influence from below, from the people or the members or, um, or whatever. And the other problem with this is that new leaders are often co-opted by the old leaders rather than just being selected based on their own merit. Now, that could be that could either be for better or for worse, right? Because if you have leaders that are really people of integrity and they want to promote people who are who are also, you know, ethical or, or good or whatever, they could co-opt good leaders, right, to be part of the leadership class. But it often doesn't tend to work that way. Um, but anyway, so the rank and file or the voters, um, we don't have the time and skill, right, to prevent this process of the consolidation of power. And um, that's because those who are more talented at leadership tend to rise to the top. Um, while sort of the rank and file, we don't have access to you know, information, we meet infrequently, we have family obligations and all kinds of other stuff um, that we have to take care of. So of course we don't have as much time to devote to whatever political party or organization that the leader does. So um, once, in, once a leader is in power, it's very difficult to get rid of that leader or to get rid of an oligarchy, right? Because the um, rank and file just can't really compete with them. They, they can't even prevent really an um, leadership class from forming to begin with. Um, so Michaels considers oligarchy to be an iron law, right? A sociological law, because it's the direct result of the bureaucracy that all governments and um, formal organizations need to function in the first place. Um, it's it doesn't just apply to political parties, but to all formal complex organizations. This could be unions, clubs, um, you know, professional association, corporations, and government, um, you know, activist groups. Um, so basically, an undemocratic leadership class always or almost always will emerge to control administration, knowledge, finance, and strategy. Okay, and that this process actually threatens democracy itself. Um, there are certainly variables that can per, sort of um, prevent or delay an oligarchy. Um, and basically, it is a generalization, but it has major implications for government. Um, so if you consider, for example, right after um, M Michael's published political parties in 1915, there was the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, right? So the Bolsheviks... Um, you know, they were known as the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, and they came to power claiming to be democratic and representative of the proletariat. But within a few years of assuming control, Lenin and Bolshevism had become completely undemocratic, right? Questioning party leadership would have gotten you um, thrown into a gulag or a special psychiatric hospital. Um, and so the party leaders basically became entrenched and they were able to um, benefit from the largesse of the bureaucracy, which they created. Um, and so that really, that, for example, really bore out Michael's theory. Um, so, yeah, the, and yet I would, I would argue that um, first, for, you know, because of this principle of the iron law of oligarchy, we should remain pretty skeptical of all mass organizations, um, of political parties, and of government itself. Because um, unless we're directly involved in leadership, it's impossible to know what really is going on, you know, on the inside. Um, or what the motivations of the leaders really are, right? Rhetoric often does not match up with how the organization actually functions in practice or with the leadership's true ideals, whatever that might be. So leaders should never be viewed as heroes, even if they seem like they're good leaders. Um, so secondly, um, it follows from Michael's argument that there might be some truth to the old adage that um, power corrupts and that absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, 
we're not, I'm not really sure if this is because the power hungry purposely will seek out positions um, which will allow them to exercise control or because there's some general flaw that's shared amongst most of humanity, right? But either way, this is human tendency needs to be acknowledged. And um, it takes someone of really exceptional character to resist the temptations of power. So third, um, it follows from Michael's argument that the more bureaucracy, the more oligarchy. Um, so governments would become oligarchical in proportion to their size and their level of complexity. So if there are many issues under a government's purview, um, the more government needs a class of bureaucrats and coordinators in charge. Um, so basically, the more socialist the government or the more bureaucratic, um, the bigger the government, um, the more quickly it would tend to become oligarchical. Um, and about this, Michael says, the socialists might conquer, but not socialism, which would per perish at the moment of its adherence triumph. And that speaks to what I mentioned before about his experience with party politics, that um, leaders might claim to be democratic, but they, their party does not function that way. And politics does not function that way. Um, Finally, um, it also follows from the iron law theory that the more or oligarchical organizations are those where the membership is most spread out geographically and which demands the least amount of participation. So think, you know, the electorate in a liberal democracy, um, you know, like us. Um, organizations which are more localized and more cooperative um, and demand more equal participation tend to be the least oligarchical. So um, basically, if you want to prevent an oligarchy from forming in some organization, it should probably be more local and more cooperative and more voluntary. So this, the, this you know, idea, the iron law of oligarchy, is really important. Um, and I think it explains a lot of why governments tend to become sort of bigger and more corrupt over time. Um, you know, it's really important, and that's why this theory still holds water after 100 years. Um, it's a really important book. Um, I would recommend getting it and reading it. Um, and yeah, I, I would say that's that's basically all for now. But um, I will link to um, my article about um, the, uh, the Iron Law of Oligarchy in the description. And... Um, yeah, this the idea of really informs a lot of my thought about um, politics um, and of why um, things tend to function the way they do. So thank you for watching. If you like this type of content, please subscribe to my channel. Um, click the bell icon so that you get notified when I upload content. Thank you so much. Take care.